Thank you for joining us this Friday. Um, here today, we have uh, Dr. Zelensky, and she's going to be discussing uh, enhancing athletic performance through optimized visual processing. Um, Dr. Zelensky, if you could just give us a, an introduction. Um, I'm sure a lot of people know who you are, but if you could just go into a little detail about that and then take it away. Hi, well, I'm Deborah Zelinsky. I'm an optometrist in Northbrook, Illinois. Um, I'm also a neuroscientist and I'm using the newest ideas that have been discovered in neuroscience and connecting them with optometry at the Mind Eye Institute. What we're doing is putting eyeglasses on patients specifically to alter brain activity as opposed to altering eyesight. We're gonna to talk today about enhancing athletic performance by optimizing visual processing. The thing you have to know about the eyes is that there, a lot of people think about eyeballs as eyeballs, a piece of your body, like a finger. But the retina, which is the lining of the eyeball, is a piece of your brain. If you took your brain and pulled a chunk forward, it would become your retina. So when we use eyeglasses, we're actually altering information in the brain, altering brain activity. And signals from around you pour in. After they pour in, your brain processes them at different levels. There's reflex levels. Like if somebody comes and tries to hit you, you duck. That's at a reflex level without thinking. And then there's levels of processing where you have strategy in sports. So when you have young children and they're working on different sports, they're building the skills. As they get bigger, they can plan and strategize in their head because the skills become automatic. So the skills we're gonna talk about today are peripheral awareness, which is what's used so much in athletics. The eye has two main components. One is your straight ahead eyesight for identification of a target. So you need that aspect for school, for driving when you're looking at a street sign or reading a license plate. If you're looking at a computer screen and you need to see detailed spreadsheets, that's when you would use the identification part of your eye. But separately, what you'd use in athletics is the peripheral part of your eye. That encompasses 94% of your surroundings. The center identification part is like a straight ahead tube. So if you're looking at a detail straight ahead to see a detail, that's the center part. But the side, all of the side, that's what's used in athletics. So we're gonna be talking about peripheral awareness. We're also gonna be talking about how you filter out unnecessary background noises and sights and movements. Reaction time, being able to track a target, uh, visualization in your mind, coordinating your eye, your head, your body, balancing and other things. But those are skills and they gotta be built and they can be built. So as I just said, the eye is a part of the brain and the retina is made out of brain tissue. And if you see the retina, the lining of the eye, it's drawn here in red, it's huge, but the 2020 part is tiny. And that's because you first scan, then you aim, then you focus. So if I scan this entire room around me, and then I decide out of all that I've been scanning, what do I have to pay attention to? Oh, that's interesting. Then I aim, then I focus. So if you have a performance in athletics that's suboptimal, what could be the cause? So you could have a problem with the muscles themselves where the physical muscles don't move the way you want. And there's a lot of eye problems that can cause that. And there's health problems that can cause that. So neurodegenerative diseases make it difficult for someone with Parkinson's to point their eyes because they don't feel where their eyes are as easily. Or uh, somebody who has a crossed eye um, can lack the proper mechanics. You could have skills that have not been developed or you can have a combination of both. So it can, phys it can be physically something's with the muscles or something's with the nerves that tell the muscles what to do, or it can be that you just don't know because you haven't developed the skill. 
the example I use often is if you give a 95 year old a new cell phone and you say, here, this phone does everything. And they look at it and they have no idea what button to push to just get a phone call. So it's not that the phone is bad and it's not that they're dumb. It's that nobody ever taught them about the strategy and how the phone is used and what buttons you would need to push for a remote control, the universal remotes that have so many buttons on it. Sometimes in your brain, you don't know which buttons to push to get the results you want. And that's stuff that could be taught and learned. So here's a, a drawing of what I just said, where you see a small letter that's identification of a target. This one little stripe of white, that's 6% of your view. All of the green part and all of the center part here, that's what you're aware of, but not paying attention to. There's a, the circle here would be your conscious awareness, but your attention is still on one letter, but you're aware of this. And the green part would be subconscious awareness. And that's really important in sports of all kinds because the awareness of the periphery is key in lots and lots of different sports. The peripheral awareness shrinks when you're under stress. So this, this example shows that there's a cone of awareness and when you're under stress, it, it shakes. If you've ever been in a restaurant and you're talking to somebody and you're in a deep conversation, the waiter can come and put a bill down or fill up your water glass or take your plate away and you may not even notice it. Those are some, when you're engrossed in attending to something straight ahead of you, completely unaware of what's going on in your periphery. When you're in a game playing, so here's an example of a football field. Here is an awareness that is shrunken. Here is an awareness that's not. So if you're this player here, you could be aware of everybody and where's the open person, or you could be just zoomed in on one particular spot. This is, again, a skill that can be taught and learned. Not only do you have to be aware of all of this, the awareness has to be such that once you choose a target, you can aim quickly and accurately. And while you're maintaining the awareness and getting the attention, you're also planning in your mind. So you have an internal component to sports of planning and an external component of this awareness. Sometimes you have too much in the background. There's sounds and then sights. So you have visual and auditory information that needs to be filtered or tuned out. Um, here's a basketball player and people are looking and there's a lot of colors and spinning and movements. Then there's on the other side, also visual and noise meters. Look at how loud the noise meter is. So you can have the auditory and visual distractions. So when you have a high level sports competition, you need to be able to tune out what's going on around you that's unnecessary, but pay attention to what is necessary like your teammates saying, hey, I'm open, shoot, you know, throw the ball to me. The neat thing is that visual skills and auditory skills are linked together. And at Mind Eye, that's what makes us unique because we're measuring auditory space, how you perceive the space around you and visual space, how you perceive that and whether or not the two are linked together. If they're not linked, then you have problems. Some of you might be thinking, well, how would you be measuring auditory space? You're an eye doctor. But if you picture it this way, pretend that you were at a wedding and somebody were clinking a glass and you heard the glass somewhere. And then the person who's clinking the glass starts walking around. Even if they're behind you, you could hear that they're on your right side and then the clinking is moving over to your left side. You're perceiving space in your mind 
even though you're only doing it through hearing a sound. That space perception is mimicked by your peripheral eyesight taking in visual space. So you have visual space and auditory space. They have to be linked together because if they don't correspond with each other and your eyes and ears aren't matched, there's confusion in your brain and you're not performing optimally. If you're not performing optimally, your reaction time is slowed down. So here's somebody reaching for a tennis ball or a baseball, basketball, soccer ball. There's moving targets that your eyes have to glimpse out of the peripheral awareness. And then your brain has to process space and time along with auditory and visual, and then make a decision and then run and, and move your body. So there's an entire reflex brain, there's an entire emotional brain, there's a thinking brain, and all of them have to be working together in, in synchrony in order to function. Now, as far as eye tracking, that would be where you're following a target. So here's a hockey game where the puck is moving or a golf swing where the ball is moving or a tennis ball or a baseball. You can follow the moving target. That still uses your peripheral eyesight, but it uses the awareness at a conscious level and the awareness at a subconscious level together. It controls your eye movements. Your brain is controlling your eye movements based on actual experience and prediction. So that predictability, it's called anticipatory movements, where if, the, if a baseball is following a trajectory, then you can anticipate where the baseball is going to end up. I'm a juggler, so that uses eye tracking also. But when you throw, if you have a juggle, if you're juggling under a strobe light, then when you toss one ball up, you see where it's going to go and you anticipate it, but then the strobe light goes off and there's nothing. And then the light comes on and you have to know where that ball was. So you have to link space and time. People don't always assume that awareness of your periphery is linked with eye tracking. Uh, in academics, when you're reading, your peripheral awareness would be on the entire paragraph and your attention would be on a word or a phrase. But you have, as you get, as when you're younger, like kindergarten, first grade, you're looking at one letter at a time and sounding out the words and decoding them. As you get older, your peripheral awareness increases and expands so that you're looking at a phrase or a word. And then you're visualizing. Swimming and diving require visualization and strategy. So there's volleyball, tennis, strategizing by visualizing what am I going to do? Where is the weakest spot? If I'm playing baseball and I know one of the outfielders is very weak at catching, then I'm going to hit the ball toward them. But in order to do that, I have to swing early if I'm going to pull the ball to left field and swing late if I'm going to pull the ball to right field, if I'm a right-handed batter. So the, the time, all of these skills need to be worked together. You visualize, you have to track the ball, you have to, to plan your reaction time, you have to be aware, and all of these skills can be enhanced. In addition to the visual skills, there's muscular skills. There's your eye, head, and body, and hand coordination. Now, sometimes we work with physical therapists or occupational therapists who are already working with patients. And when you put different glasses on that alter the person's center of gravity, then they have to shift their body a different way, which then changes their head position and changes their eye position. And it changes their perception of space. If I'm leaning back, the computer screen looks much farther away from me than if I'm leaning forward. 
So when I lean forward, there's more of the computer pouring in my eye. When I lean back, I have some of the room pouring in my eye also. So each of these is used together. And then on top of that, there's balance. How a body reacts. Oops, let me see. Combining all these, sorry. I want to get back to the one, the one that was before this. Sorry. How a, bot, how a body reacts to deviations. In other words, ad adaptability and flexibility. So we'll go back to this one. And show uh, presenter view. This one. Oops, there we go. Okay, so balance like bicycle riding when you lean or don't lean. It's amazing what you have to do while you're on a bicycle. Uh, we have a lot of patients from Amsterdam and many of them have bike accidents because there's so many bicycles. This here appears to be a race, but in Amsterdam, the bicycles are as popular as cars and they're just everywhere. You have to be watching all the time. If your mind is wandering and you're thinking too much, you might miss something. It's, it's the human body is amazing on what it can balance with. In order to combine all of these skills, it's important to learn. We take, so what we do at Mind Eye Institute is evaluate each of those skills separately and we link it with adaptability. How, if we put glasses on you that all of a sudden tilt you backwards, how do you adapt? Are you fearful? Are you stressed? Or do you go, whoa, that's pretty neat, and just readapt? Because there's the gamut of changes. Those people who readapt really quickly, one way, but then we lean you forward, and then you're like, whoa, that's too scary. That's a person who can do one thing, but not another. So you might have a person who on a basketball court can shoot from the left, but not from the right. Or somebody who's playing tennis and their backhand is perfect and they can aim and plan, but their forehand is terrible. Or their forehand and their backhand are good, but their serve is bad. So each sport separately has many, 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 many different skills. So when you're testing and you say, well, what sport do you play? What, where is your weakness? You can build those or what a lot of patients do is they like us to guess. So if I analyze, say, a baseball player or a tennis player, I can guess based on how their visual processing is measured. Oh, you're good playing the net at tennis, but not the backcourt or you know, you probably play the infield at baseball because you'd make a terrible outfielder or pitchers. Pitchers have to be able to have really good side eyesight because they have to catch somebody who's stealing a base. But the pitcher also has to have razor sharp straight ahead eyesight to see the catcher's signals. And there's different ways that your brain can process. So like Michael Jordan, who's unparalleled so far in basketball, wasn't as good of a baseball player because it's different skills. So in summary, all aspects of sports require visual skills, but they're learned and you form habits over the years and those habits can be changed. So if you get used to a tennis racket and holding it a certain way or a golf club holding it a certain way, and somebody says, hey, here's a better way. It'll make your shoulders move more smoothly. It takes a while, but you can learn and change those skills. So we can use glasses and visual rehabilitation to do that. So it's I'm trying to leave time for questions tonight, and we have a bunch of them. So I'd like to make sure we get to all the questions. So I tried to make this a little bit shorter. Um, Jordan, do you have a list of questions for us? I do, I do. I have quite a few. So um, what we'll do here is I'll, I'll start with the um, the ones that um, 
patients have been putting in the comments, and then we'll um, we'll go down the other list um, as well here. Um, so the first one, I'm actually going to kind of combine to Frankie and Nisa both had similar questions. Um, so their questions were, what if you have no peripheral vision and, you know, what if there's peripheral vision loss due to injury? So I, I think that those can be kind of put together on that. Well, sometimes you can lose half of your peripheral eyesight from strokes. So that's called a hemianopic field. So hemianopsia. Uh, so if their question means when you've lost half of your eyesight, or sometimes you can do quadrantopsia where it's a quarter of your eyesight or two quarters on different sides. That's one thing, but when they're saying, do, when I have no peripheral vision, I assume they're meaning that th there's some sort of stroke or brain injury that's created blackness. Mm -hmm. There's no problem though, in learning how to use your mind to fill in that field. So if let's say you're missing the right-hand side of your eyesight and each eye, neither eye can see on the, on the right side, you only see on the left but your brain knows that there's a right side because we're not talking about neglect. We're talking about loss of peripheral eyesight. So you know in your head there is a right side, but I don't see it. You have a backup system called blind sight and that blind sight system at a lower level be below your conscious level knows what's there. So they've done studies on that where somebody's had no eyesight at all and they've said, here, reach for this object. And the person will say consciously, I don't see any object, I can't tell. And the tester will say, well, just try anyway. And if they're handed a book, they take their hand like this to take the book. If they're handed a pencil, you know, they take their fingers. If they're handed a beach ball, they, they put their hands out like this, it's a big beach ball. So blind sight, uh, if you Google it, uh, it's called blind sight phenomena. Uh, that is a backup plan in your brain for knowing what's going on in a missing field. In addition to that, some people can use eyeglasses that have little like rearview mirrors on them and learn how to look into the rearview mirror to see what's in the missing field. Or you can use um, an eye throw technique that Neil Margolis developed called the Margolis eye throwing technique. And as you're walking, you pull your eyes to see what's over there and glimpse it and then pull your eyes straight again. So if you're looking at athletic performance, but you're missing part of your visual field, but you move your head to grab what information is there, um, you still can learn. Meanwhile, again, with the space, you're not asking about auditory space. So there's uh, like, for instance, um, beeping balls that can be played, softball can be played with a beeping ball and you can hear the ball moving around and judge the space. So they even have like baseball for blind people where the ball just beeps. Uh, so I hope that answered that question. Yeah, yeah I think that was good. Mm -hmm. um, so do, do I have to wear the glasses while I'm actively playing the sport to see improvements or can you go into a little bit more detail about that? Uh, no, you don't have to wear them during the sport, but it depends on what level of transition you're in. In other words, if you first come, you're going to have habits. And if they're either they're not developed or they're, they're developed in their bad habits. So we find which ones we're, I'm assuming they're bad because you're coming here to say, help me play better. So we find which habits are poor or, and then we would put some sort of glasses on to disrupt the habits and provide you with information a different way. But then you have to have the glasses on and off and on and off because every time they're on, you would have a new habit. When you take it off, you'll be at your old habit. You put it on, you have the new habit. So there's a point where your brain has to learn, okay, why is it more comfortable with the new habit? What am I doing differently? And then I take the glasses off and find, oh, you're, you can do it on your own. Usually the glasses are not meant for seeing, they're just meant for learning how to judge the space around you and therefore you'd move your muscles differently. So for instance, if I have glasses that make everything look way higher, I'm gonna tip my chin up and then my eyes pull down and it's not very comfortable. 
So if I have glasses that move things downwards, my neck is going to come down and my eyes are going to come down and that's not very comfortable. So we'll be measuring comfort ranges and tolerance ranges and putting your glasses either in comfort or tolerance, depending on what's needed. Uh, but the answer to your question is once you learn a new skill and it's solid, then it should transfer into your sport playing all by itself. You may need to use the glasses at first while you're playing so that you can have you know, space, spatial awareness changes while you're in, actually in a game and using strategies and you're under pressure. Um, but you know, it's not necessarily always needed. Because so the yeah, they're like <laughs> training wheels on a bicycle. You'll use them for a while, and then once you've got the hang of it, you don't need them anymore. Or yeah, like a rehabilitative tool. Yes, that's a better way to put it. Um, let's see. Um, do we have to wear glasses, or or contacts an option? Uh, it depends on what the prescription is. So that's 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 not an answerable question. Yeah. So sometimes contacts work, but sometimes there's very, very specific prescriptions which don't come in contacts. Mm -hmm. Or if you if you blink, the contact would rotate. So some of the prescriptions have to be rotated a very specific way to get a cropping effect. Uh, so it's it's a toss up. I, I wouldn't be able to say yes or no. Yeah, yeah. You got to give percentages. Maybe eighty percent cannot wear the contacts, and twenty percent can for sports like this. Got it. Got it. Okay. That's good. Um, let's see. Uh, this person has, they have 20, 20 vision. Um, and is there a way for them to kind of evaluate at home to see if this would be something that would be beneficial for them? Uh, well, 20, first of all, 20, 20 eyesight is just that little speck of straight ahead eyesight, like looking through a drinking straw. So, okay. And 20, 20, is something that was invented during the Civil War. And it's only measuring central eyesight because during the Civil War, that's what was expected of the eyes. That's all they thought the eyes were for. Uh, so just because you have 2020 and your doctor says you don't need any prescription, you might need it for the periphery to balance in case. So, so the answer is, can we do on Zoom something? And the answer is yes, we could do some, there's a, like a mini screening to see whether there, your spatial awareness is good or not. Okay. But we have a lot of patients that are 2020 for the center of their eye. And sometimes, sometimes people have glasses that create the 2020 and it messes up the periphery. And so we might make them 2025 and, but they're thrilled because the the space is processed better and their headaches go away and their migraines go away or they play basketball better because you don't use the 2020 uh, testing finding that central part of your eye for sports hardly at all that actually segues well into our, our next question um, if, if you're changing um, those neurological pathways uh, can fixing one issue cause another um, you know, that's, in other words, are, are there cases of people leaving worse than when they started? That's a really good question. Uh, sometimes, yes, but it's very short-lived. It's almost like cleaning out a closet. You have this really messy closet and a really clean living room. And you have to take everything out of the messy closet to put it in the living room to then rearrange the closet and put it all back. So temporarily, one, sure, once you start changing an old habit, you, you might get worse till you get better. But once you get better, you're way better. Mm -hmm. um, if you have now, I've worked with uh, baseball players, let's say, and what we'll do in, in Florida back in the 80s. And we didn't work with them during their season because you don't want to have them get worse in the middle of their season. You know, all their batting averages are getting. So um, we worked with them on the off season. Got it. Got it. Yeah. So definitely an off off season if we're looking at optimization for sports. Yes. Good. Um, what if uh, what if a person struggles with multiple issues? Like they want to improve on the baseball field, uh, but they're also having issues in the classroom. 
um, would would one prescription work for kind of everything or is it something that they might need to work on multiple different things? They might need different prescriptions for the classroom and the sports field because in the classroom, as I said, they need to um, shift their eyes to very close and very far up and back and up and back. Whereas on a sport and they're looking at details, I'm looking at detail on my paper and a detail on the board. In a sports arena, you're looking up and down and sideways, but not super close to your face. And you're looking for more moving targets rather than stationary targets. And you're not identifying something, you're navigating. So you're using a different system when you're playing sports. Uh, so it may be a different glass, possibly. It also may be that it's one glass, but you learn different skills. So it's without evaluating that particular person, you know, the answer is, I don't know, but the likelihood that there'd be two different pairs of glasses, uh, but it's possible that one, if there's skills that are missing and you build the skills up, then you may not need any glasses. Um, let's see. Um, how does this differ from other sports vision therapy options? Well, if the, the two biggest ish, the differences are that we use auditory space because the eyes and ears are so linked together. And we use um, glasses that are meant for peripheral eyesight as opposed to central eyesight. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Um, and I, I know you talked a little bit about, you know, having worked with um, some baseball players and things. Well, what is, I mean, what is our experience with working with athletes? We've, I mean, you've been doing this for quite some time now. Um, I'm sure you've, you know, seen a, a wide variety of different athletes and, you know, at, at different levels of deficits. We have, I've, I've had NFL players. Uh, actually, we, it's, um, it's funny because I don't know too much about football but I know plenty about visual skills. And I remember having one uh, NFL player and I, I asked what he did, you know, for like, how do you use your visual skills? And it was really funny because his, his eye movements were unbelievable. We have a test where you look from place to place, back and forth as fast as you can. And the average is around 17, 18 times. A really good finding might be 27. So this guy was moving. And he, he wrote like the machine couldn't calibrate. So I said, you got to go slower. So he went where he thought it was like a snail's pace, slow, 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 slow. And he got a 60, which is like, like, like I said, super fast is 27 for an average person. This guy, when he wasn't even trying and he was going as slow as he could to, he got 60. So it, it's astounding what an NFL type player can do with their eyes. Um, but what's our experience? We have football, baseball, basketball, soccer, tennis, golf, boxing. We had an Olympic swimmer here, um, hockey, uh, even wrestling. You know, the, the boxing was actually one of my favorite sports to work with because I did not realize I have so much respect for boxers because I had no idea. I didn't realize how much peripheral awareness is used and how much... Um, strategy and thinking is used to plan for boxing. When you're just a lay person watching, it looks like people are just beating each other up. But when you're really getting into the strategies and the planning, it's hard. I think boxing was harder than any of the other games I was I was looking at. Hmm. That's that's interesting. So the 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 thinking and visualization part is is that a big part of some of the um you know sports optimization components in that as well? Absolutely. But that's a higher level. As I said earlier, when little kids are learning, first you learn the skills. Once the skills are in place, they have to become automated. Then you can get the strategies. Because So like football plays, when they, they draw out, you know, here's one play, here's another play, here's another play. You have to be able to perceive the space around you and which person is going where and when you throw the ball. Oh. Or tennis. Uh, I was a tennis player. I was on a team and uh, it was interesting because from a visual end, if I wanted, I wasn't fast, but I was very good at strategizing and I could plan where I hit the ball anywhere. So I would put colorful jackets up on a fence behind me because that would be a visual distraction to the person on the other side. 
And they, it was so, nobody's aware of that, but, you know, cause they have to then tune out the background. And if you have very colorful things in the background, it's harder, it uses up some of your visual energy. And if you tune it out too much, you also constrict your peripheral awareness. Um, mm -hmm. But you, there's all kinds of things that can be done. Uh, so as far as our background and our, our you know, experience with sports, we've got all kinds. I've got 40 years of background. Uh, we typically don't put that on our website because, uh, I mean, we've had golfers too. I was involved in a golf project back in the 90s. But on our website, we cater more toward helping like the autistic population, the learning disability population, and the um, brain injury population, uh, mostly because of the, the ghost in my brain and uh, and the concussions. And it's from my own thought process, although it's fun to be able to get people to say, hey, you know, ever since I got your new glasses, you knocked three strokes off my golf game or Ever since my new glasses were, you know, my kid's been making goals in hockey in uh, soccer all the time or hockey playing. Uh, that's fun. But to me, where the expertise is needed um, is, you know, in, in helping people's lives become better with concussions and autism. Um, I mean, I like all of the different aspects uh, and optimizing sports performance is something people don't realize because they don't realize eyes and ears should be connected. So, you know, obviously we don't turn any types of patients away, but the the gist of what we're we've been marketing would be would have been uh, legal blindness, and we don't have that on the website either. Um, I spent years doing a low vision rotation. I directed clinics for macular degeneration. Um, I have an extensive background in working with macular degeneration patients to teach them how to use the peripheral awareness. We had an eight week course called the Macular Connection and none of that is on our website either. So I think what we have to do is change around some of what we are, we're showing because it, it doesn't show right now. Um, yeah. we, from a uh, from an athletic point of view, the people who are passionate about the different sports, every single shot makes a difference. You know, you're playing football every single touchdown. You're playing baseball. You know, if you strike out, you have self esteem issues too. We work a lot with um, high school kids. We see them more because of the brain injuries, but you have to get them back to return to play. So after sports, so. So I would think that our our help for athletics would be more of returning people back to play, building up skills to prevent concussions. Um, that's where I see mind eyes uh, realm is optimizing how they play, teaching people how to filter out noises, how to filter out sights, how to strategize while they're running, um, building up visual processing skills. Awesome. Actually, this that cycles us into a, a no pun intended. That that brings us back into a a good question from Elizabeth. Um, she wants to know if that you have any specific advice for um, you know different visual exercises for um, cyclists or whitewater kayakers or you know anything like that who are um, post concussion when they're kind of early in their stages. Uh, yes. The, I had one, uh, something, I forgot what she called it. It was like, um, it's a super athlete, uh, ultimate athlete. There's a name. I, I'm sure somebody in the audience would know it. It was a, it was some sort of ultimate athlete. It was like more than an Ironman. Um, I think it was called ultimate. Anyway, uh, from kayaking or whitewater rafting. Yes, you, you have to, <laughs> cause you end up having to have backpacks packed. Um, but when you're moving around in the water, you have to lean one way, lean another way. Uh, so is, is, read the question again. It was what in early stages of a concussion? Or do you... Yeah, it looks like they're they're in the early stages um, of kind of re returning to sport. Um, so they're they're trying to get back into that uh, post concussion, um, and it looks like they're still having some um, some issues with uh, some of their peripheral awareness and things like that. There's also the inner ear. There's a whole bunch of circuitry for postural stability. 
So you, if you're kayaking, that's the circuitry between the posture stability while the kayak is moving and the visual processing of the movement, your movement and object movement, those two have to be synchronized. So if you have a concussion and you're trying to return to kayaking or whitewater rafting, the postural stability becomes the more important one. That has to be in place first. And then secondly, the, um, the glimpsing, the scanning, because you have scanning, aiming and focusing in your environment. But before you can do that, you got to be stable. Uh, Skeffington, who invented developmental optometry, had that where am I pathway came before the where is it pathway. Um, so so her, the advice to her would be work on your gaze stabilization techniques, work on balance, uh, but don't push. It's the same as what we tell our patients. You have a comfort range and a tolerance range. Stay within your comfort range. Don't push. And if, so if you're, if you're trying to go back into kayaking, first do something in your house that requires your sense of balance to be shifted. Then try, you know, just a little bit and then try a little bit more, but find where your cutoff point is, where it's too much for you. Because, I mean, we have people who can't even drive with the windshield wipers on. I mean, for somebody who's trying to get back into kayaking or whitewater rafting, I would drive with the windshield wipers on and see if you could take that movement and see how that is. Yeah, actually that I, Rebecca, I, I apologize. I, I didn't see your question here. It actually kind of mixes with that a little bit. She asked about um, where kind of jostling would fit in um, post-concussion. She's unable to tolerate any jostling, whether running or taking long drives um, is this a disconnect between the vestibular system and the, and the eyes, uh, which I think. It, well, it is, but it could also be a, a problem between the right side and the left side. So if you had some sort of injury and when you're running and one hip moves and it's not moving at the same speed or height as the other one, because your, your leg, uh, your leg and your knee and your ankle aren't working as a team. Those are people that we work with, um, in conjunction with uh, neuro movement, which is a not Banyel's method, or we work with uh, Moskitova's reflex integration because sometimes after a concussion, their primitive reflexes reemerge, uh, or we work with OTs or PTs or um, integrative manual therapy specialists. So, there are physiology people, there's um, there's chiropractors, functional neurologists. There's there's so many different types. It wouldn't necessarily just be eyesight or peripheral eyesight. So, so we have a pretty large uh, um, network of people that we work with and and refer out to as well. We, we work with a lot of other practitioners and things on people's recovery from concussions, whether it be athletic um, recovery or you know a, any sort of injury. Yeah, I mean, we have to because you know, we're not magic doctors. We don't have magic glasses that we put on somebody. People have all different aspects. That's why we had the slides up here with the balance and the eye-hand coordination because that's not our field. We work in conjunction with other people. Um, Perfect. Perfect. Um, let's see. Um, Regina had a question about uh, her son. He's he's four years old, um, has balancing issues from repetitive head trauma, uh, frequently tripping and bumping his head and falling over. Mm -hmm. um, do you have any um, advice or recommendations for her? So the four-year-old, because he's been tripping, he's falling and hitting his head. So that tells me he's not putting his hands out to catch himself. So that tells me as a reflex that's not kicked in. That's what Moskatova's method works the best for. So there'll be that's where I would start. If you have a four-year-old who's not catching himself when he falls and his head is falling, flopping forward, you're missing a reflex. Put the reflex in place. Okay. okay. Um, let's see. Um, Andrew's question is, uh, do, do astigmatisms go away with proper learning? Can the brain adjust the shape of the eyeball with a different application of bending light to get the brain to readjust the eyeball shape? 
That's another smart question. The answer is yes. The shape itself, function, function and structure go together. So the fact that they wrote, you know, can the shape of the eyeball change? Sure. Uh, years and years ago, they, they talked about the front of the eye is like a car windshield. So it's curved. And what happens is your eyelids sit on it. So it's kind of curved and bent this way. And that's one type of astigmatism. And in the 40s, 50s, 60s, when they measured this type of a shape, they called it with the rule because it, most of the people had their lids pushing down and then the fluid in the eye flows in a circle that way. So you have the fluid flowing and the eyelids pushing and that was how the astigmatism developed. But it, when it did that, it's, uh, it allowed you to see wider, but starting in, I guess the seventies or sixties, late mid seventies, more and more and more people were watching television, were reading, you know, close up. They were developing astigmatism, which curved inwards, sideways. And they used to call that against the rule because very few people had that. And nowadays when people are on computer screens and cell phones, more and more and more and more people have the sideways squishing instead of the top and bottom squishing. So it's so the point is that astigmatism develops based on the function. So the structure of the eye changes because of the function. So when you change the function, then the structure can change back. Or your brain might have the same structure of astigmatism, but you don't need the but but you don't need the glasses to be a crutch. You can learn to to see without them just fine. Uh, the only when you get sharpened for astigmatism, it sharpens your central eyesight, but it distorts your peripheral eyesight. And if your peripheral eyesight is needed, like for sports, then wearing glasses with astigmatism uh, often can be a hindrance. I mean, I would love to get my hands on some sporting play players and be able to change the glasses to enhance peripheral awareness and show people where you could, you know, be better and have better visual skills just from switching out of central mode into peripheral mode. Are there a lot of studies on on that, or is that something that would be a, a great opportunity? It would be a great opportunity. There's some studies, but not, I mean, they have studies, but not w adding in the auditory space. No. Awesome. Um, this is a good question. Um, Eric said, is there any research for persistent symptoms after concussion, i.e. post-concussion syndrome? Uh, additionally, persistent symptoms often arise in various forms. Some people experience migraines, others dizziness. Um, how do the glasses aid in these different primary symptoms of persistent symptoms after concussion? Are there studies showing what, what is it? Are there studies showing things about the symptoms? Is that what you? Yeah, asking? I think I think uh, they're asking. Are you know what what is the what is the research um, stating about um, the relief um, for things like migraines and dizziness? Um, there's studies showing there's there's a tint called FL forty one, which is a pinkish tint. Uh, and there's studies showing that for migraine sufferers you know, that's helpful. There's actually a bunch of new medicines for migraines, the triptans and some other, st the, the CGRP stuff um, that, that are used. So there's new medications for migraines and there is um, tints for migraines. Those I know of research for. Um, migraines come often from the trigeminal nerve, which comes down the face and the head. Uh, when the those nerves release a particular chemical, it increases inflammation in the body and actually in the brain, in the blood vessels. And you can use medicines to help it, or you can use a tint to calm the incoming information. Uh, those are the only studies that I know of. Um, Arnold Wilkins has a lot of studies on migraines. That's his, that's been his whole focus and various colors. Um, Bill Padula has a bunch of uh, studies on post-concussion syn syndrome, um, but I don't know of any particular studies on relief of symptoms. 
uh, I do know of a lot of neurooptometry practices that use eyeglasses and visual skill building to uh, lessen symptoms. Gotcha. Okay. Okay. This is a good question from uh, from Allison. Um, how do different types of sports eyewear, i.e., goggles, helmets, visors, um, impact visual performance? How do the different types? Well, they have soft ones that curve around your face. They have harder ones that have shields. Uh, the ones that have shields where you can't see on the periphery, those are much harder to use if you're in a sport that requires wide awareness. Um, but they, I'm, I'm not sure what you're asking. How do they impact you? Yeah, could you train off? So say a person's wearing a, a baseball helmet, for instance, and that's causing a distraction in that upper peripheral, maybe. Mm -hmm. um, could you could you train the, you know, the visual field to kind of ignore some of that and focus on more of what's, you know, out in front of them? Or um, are there benefits to that? Would that be beneficial for, a, you know, a baseball player? Mm, not pretty. So are you saying that She's saying that the if the sports goggles or the helmet is bothering you, is that what she's saying? You know, is that uh, I'm not they, sure I understand the question. Yeah, they just said how how do different types of sports eyewear impact visual performance? Different course. Of, well, I'm wondering whether they mean the physical physical frames, which are different, or the actual lenses, because you like for instance, a swimming lens, you can only get them in this. You can get lenses put into a mask or you can get lenses that are pre-made. So when they say different, it's throwing me because I don't know what you mean by different types of sports eyewear. I know they have the wraparound kind. They have the um, these the soft kind. There's, there's cushiony ones that are good because they can go under a helmet. But I'm not sure that I understand the question. Well, it looks like she's asking about uh, the actual physical frames um, are they, is it a distraction for eyesight? Oh, that's what's in. Uh, it shouldn't be because you learn to ignore it. Uh, the, the people who need sports performing glasses, like, uh, like for instance, we had a baseball player and they were trying to get into the major leagues and the night games they couldn't perform in the day games. They were great. So they needed special glasses just for a night game that had a particular tint to, to allow their rods, the, the peripheral part of their eyes, to work more efficiently. So in some cases, the peripheral, the, the eyewear is helpful. In other cases, it might block out some of what you're looking at, but you need it in order to see Um the soft ones, there's soft ones, which are a lot, were very good. And the newer ones are designed so that you get plenty of view. So I don't see that there'd be any issue that the, the, the people who invented protective eyewear do it so that you still have your peripheral eyesight. When we have here, um, the, uh, the sports goggles, and we have many different kinds. Some kinds are actually just hard in the front and very, very soft on the sides. Those are really, really helpful. Okay. Okay. Great. Well, that we've uh, we've managed to make it through just about everything. There's, I think, there's one more here um, that we probably have time for. Um, Louis says, "What if I can't drive to your office? Is is there an option for us to be able to help? You know, remotely, or um, you know, what what does that look like?" Um, well, if you can't drive, you always can fly, but, uh, as far as remotely, that's a tricky question. Uh, we can do some things, but we really need a physical person here in order to get a good assessment. We have like a four hour assessment and we test a ton of visual skills. We evaluate the patient how they, what their comfort ranges are, what their tolerance ranges are, how they perceive space, how they adapt to space. You can't do all of that on a Zoom. You know, you can get basic knowledge, but, um, but not, we, we can't really get what we need. Sometimes though, we can do like one initial evaluation here. And once we have that and we can pinpoint the areas that need, then we can have patients follow up 
with other providers and we can do Zoom then. Yeah. But the initial evaluation is usually much better off in person. Now but we, which state are they from? Um, Pennsylvania. Oh, that's if they can't drive, if they physically can't be in a car that long, is that the or they themselves can't drive? Um, I think it's probably yeah they've got vertigo and um, it, it, would, it would be a situation where maybe we could help stabilize them through a telehealth aspect and then have them come in you know if if we can get them to a point where they're stabilized. Maybe uh, we had one person from uh, Janesville, Wisconsin, and she had to be kind of drugged up, and she had her doctor drug her, so she was sedated and she laid in the whole back seat, and somebody else drove her here. Uh, and she came a day early so that the sedation would wear off. So, you know, it's possible, but oh. it's not, that's not the preferred method. Right. Uh, but we also, we've had people who, who, you know, they get massive headaches with, you know, driving, you know, just less than a mile. I mean, it's, we have people that are so sensitive. Um, the, to go back to the athletes, the, since this is about athletic performance, the really good thing about athletes is that they're disciplined. So for instance, uh, Kevin Pierce, who was a snowboarder, is, is so disciplined. He got so much better because he followed what to do. There was, there was no you know, going back. When you're a disciplined athlete, you, you just follow what you're supposed to do. And this, the lady I spoke to that was that ultimate athlete, or I'm just not sure it was all, I think it was ultimate, um, same thing. You say what to do. You know, you tell me what hot coals to walk over. And if you tell me on the other side of those hot coals, I know what I need, I'll do it. And I don't see that in the general population. I see it in the athletes. Um, but to optimize sports performance so you get an edge on other people so that you can win, you can play better, and you can avoid concussions. That's my passion would be helping people who are in athletic um, groups to avoid concussions, to avoid tripping, to, you know, as an aside, they will play better. It's almost like here, uh, we had a, we had a meeting once and somebody said, oh, you know, you're so good at helping people. And I answered, well, I solve math puzzles because I'm a mathematician and a neuroscientist and I like solving the puzzles. And because I solve the puzzles, the patients are helped. So it would be the same with me for athletics. I like solving puzzles. I like preventing injuries. I like building up people's visual skills. And as an aside, this, whoever was playing in sports would have an edge because they'd play better. They'd play longer. They'd have better endurance, better strategizing, quicker reaction times, those types of things. So you build the visual skills and help the the people, but I do it from a from a puzzle solving point of view. I, I like taking the people who've been everywhere and have 10 different doctors and then we take them for you know four hours and we can figure out things that other people weren't even looking for. The that's what the eye ear connection is all about. People eye ear connections have to be used to upgrade the standard eye exam because the standard eye exam is great for regular people but it's not for brain injured people. It's not enough for athletes because the standard eye exam is using straight ahead eyesight and athletes don't use that. So you got to have another way to evaluate. And the eye ear connection testing has got to become an upgrade to the eye examination. It's just, there's no reason we should be stuck in the civil war guidelines no. for, for brain injured patients. I mean, it's a, somebody said like, well, I've used it, but somebody was telling me the other day, they said, you know, wheels on a suitcase could have been invented in the 1920s by just nailing a roller skate to the bottom of a suitcase. Nobody did that. So for the twenties, the thirties, the forties, the fifties, people were lugging luggage all over the place when they could have just slid it around on a roller skate. And it's the same thing with eye ear connections. There are people walking around whose eyes and ears don't connect properly. There are people playing in athletic performances that don't link their eyes and ears. They can listen or watch, but because of that, their reaction time is slowed. And if we could put that together by using eyeglasses to link those two and building the skills, 
they'll be they're in a different league of performance. 